Hi, I'm Daza Greenwood uh, from MIT Media Lab and also executive director of law.mit.edu, which is the convener of today's workshop, the eighth annual MIT Computational Law Workshop. Uh, let's, uh, let's get right into it. Um, so my name is Brian, as I mentioned. Um, you know, I work at a I work as a legal engineer at a company called Upside that helps organizations launch and manage tokens. Um, notable to that, um, I'm working pretty closely on a project that is actually launching a social media DAO with over 1.5 million users in the next uh, couple of months. Um, so a bit of a user and social media network that is actually governed by uh, through a DAO with multiple tiers of voting. Um, and then also work as a co-founder for a tokenized real estate fund that is gearing up to launch um, sometime in Q2 um, that helps transform re rental relationships and real estate deals by making it so that investors are paid off earlier than they usually would be at a stated rate of return that's comparable to what they would normally expect. But in these deals in our model, the tenants actually buy a fractional interest in the property each month instead of paying rent. So it goes from being something of an adversarial relationship to one that's more generative. And, and both of these examples get to this kind of underlying hypothesis that I have uh, around governance, which is that it can be composed and hence the notion composable governance. And when I finish my slides, I'll hand it over to Wasim and he'll be able to um, do his intro and talk expand a little bit more on what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, throughout history, people have used different legal instruments as a means to engineer so societal outcomes. Um, so, you know, I think everybody's familiar, like, with the Code of Hammurabi and how the Code of Hammurabi was actually really notable because it gave people notice about what was happening, um, uh, what the laws were, um, what the penalties were, and this was a really big transformation. And um, and each of these, um, each of these, at a rudimentary level, each of these outcomes can actually be engineered. Um, so all of these different tools can kind of be combined with a business, a legal, a technical, and a cultural. Um, oh, sorry, and at, at a and at a cultural level to um, help the communities get to closer to to where they actually want to be. So, you know, I think a really great example of this is with, um, you know, with precious metal currencies like gold. So, you know, the business case for gold, gold has a measurable value, um, you know, as a, as a legal tool, it reduces transactional complexity by having these denominations that it can be meted out in and traded with. Um, and kind of at the technical level or the architectural level or the, 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 the properties of gold are such that it can be melted, it can be recast, it doesn't corrode. It's not so heavy as to become unbearable to carry. Um, and as a kind of cultural phenomena, it, the use of gold in trading increased transactional velocity and, and predictability and certainty within these bazaars and in markets that were spanning very big um, geographic distances. So it, it became easier for trade to happen you know, more globally than, than locally. And I think, um, you know, as we're getting to, you know, this idea of digital contracts and, and with smart contracts, we're, we're kind of going even further. Um, so among others, the inventions of Bitcoin and Ethereum helped the world realize two things. Um, so first, the concept of a blockchain created a new tool for recording transactions. I don't think I'm telling any tall tales here but it made it uh, more explicit and more viable to operate without a, a centralized intermediary. Uh, and second, and perhaps more importantly, the creative use of smart contracts built for the needs of individuals demonstrated an ability to explicitly program transactional systems to achieve specified types of outcomes. So because a centralized intermediary is no longer required, it then becomes possible for communities to specify the types of incentives that they want to build into their communities. So this idea is powerful because it shows that communities are able to be composed with explicit sets of rules using various of the tools previously referenced as a mean of affecting the will of groups of all different sizes. So it can be, it can be big, it can be little, 
And this was really the motivating factor for why we wanted to do the um, special release on composable governance. Um, and we have a bunch of uh, bunch of great uh, publication or uh, you know bunch of great articles that were published in the initial cohort of this uh, composable governance special release. I will let everybody go to law.mit.edu to check these out more. I was going to spend a bit more time. Uh, on some of these, but we're we're kind of time pressed at the moment. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Wasim and um, have him kind of expand on the on on these foundations. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I guess we'll take a step back. So just for very quickly introduce myself. So I'm Wasim Al Sindi. I'm the technology editor at the MIT Computational Law Report, and I suppose I'm a bit more familiar with the computational side than the law side. Um, so I'm a, a guest interdisciplinary scholar uh, using um, various lenses from the scientific, philosophical and artistic traditions um, to uh, study peer-to-peer um, -peer headless decentralized systems uh, such as uh, blockchain-based uh, networks and systems. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we've been talking about this concept of composable governance as we've been preparing to release uh, the papers that Brian just introduced, and uh, we had over the summer uh, one of our um, kind of a free flowing discussion sessions, an uh, idea flow uh, on composable governance. Uh, so I thought I'd just spend a few minutes uh, recapping some of the interesting things that came out of that, and also taking a step back about like you know why do we want to move towards composability for governance, and uh, what does it mean? What do we get this in terms of um, affordances and potentials, and then also just a couple of examples. Uh, from different spheres uh, that might guide a, a way to some of our possible futures. Um, so yeah, on the screen is just like a, a few cliff notes uh, where we're, you know, thinking about what we're really trying to do here. So especially with a peer-to-peer -peer headless decentralized system where there is no kind of ordained authority, uh, we're trying to find some kind of way of uh, having this, you know, whatever, this assemblage, this kind of patchwork of different entities that aren't necessarily connected, aren't necessarily uh, sharing uh, the same um, interests or, or outlooks, how do they come together to the extent that um, they can find a common path forwards uh, through a community? Um, and so, um, you know, there have been different kinds of business, uh, like business, legal and organizational uh, templates that have attempted to uh, uh, give this kind of coordination affordance uh, over time. And, um, you know, we're just going to kind of uh, you know, stay to the to the present and maybe look to the near future, uh, where I'm sure a lot of the people on the call uh, are familiar with the concept of, of trusts. And uh, we talked about fiduciary uh, duties earlier. And we're also going to talk about uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, which I'm sure uh, most also of, of people on the call are probably familiar with uh, by now. I'll try to look at some like similarities and differences and also kind of like commonalities and intents and, and purposes. And so, yeah, we are doing legal and technical engineering here. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, let's take a step back and think about, like, you know, what what, what do we mean by composability? Uh, you know, how, how are we um, trying to engineer systems that uh, we uh, uh, can um, uh, give us some kind of new finer grained uh, affordances in terms of flexibility and adaptability? And so, yeah, here are four uh, kind of axioms, I suppose you could say, that come from the MetaGov Modular Politics paper, which is quite a seminal work. Uh, in this in this area, highly recommend anybody uh, checks it out if they haven't already. Um, and uh, we kind of uh, reduced down the desiderata to like four uh, key categories. So uh, modularity, so that we have this kind of ability to hop, swap, and plug and play with different kinds of um, uh, features and capacities. This could be like a voting system. It could be a consensus mechanism. Uh, it could be you know any one of a series of things put into a like a a supply chain, you could say, of governance or a loop in a more cybernetic sense. Uh, so your expressiveness, uh, should, uh, the, the layer should be able to implement as wide a range of processes as possible. So this is, a, again, about the breadth, like bringing breadth from the flexibility. Uh, portability, so that we can kind of have this kind of platform agnostic sense that I can take a tool from one place and apply it relatively uh, simply in another context. And interoperability so that the different parts of these different systems can talk to each other so we can then make networks of networks and systems and systems because uh, we can all see that's where everything is going, right? Everything is getting more connected. And even though the individual entities, individual, like you know, if they're, they're people or they're 
business entities or institutions, um, they can be of different sizes, but the, the connectivity, the meshes that we're creating are the things which are expanding. Uh, next slide, please, Brian. And so, uh, yeah, moving a little bit from theory to practice, so building on the work from uh, Messing Up Modular Politics, um, there was this uh, interesting paper on called Policy Kit, which is um, trying to put a lot of this into practice. Um, and so uh, yeah, this is kind of like a, a governance supply flow that I was just talking about. But I was talking about it in an abstract sense. Uh, here's something that is kind of like uh, specified and codified. And there are um, uh, sample models, uh, little bits of co uh, code on GitHub repositories. Uh, so I highly recommend people uh, navigate over to the uh, MetaGov website to, to take a look at uh, some of those resources and affordances. Um, next slide, Brian. And uh, this is a project uh, called Zodiac, which is coming out of uh, Gnosis, which is like a very early uh, DeFi project on Ethereum, uh, which moved more towards a collective governance when its initial uh, specification, its initial brief of trying to build prediction markets, it was a bit too difficult to do at the time. Uh, so what's been great is they've kind of really uh, wholeheartedly um, uh, taken a leading role in building a lot of the tooling and infrastructure, not just on Ethereum, but that's like um, platform agnostic. So it's being used in all kinds of different places. So this is a, a, like an app store, like it's an app, uh, you know, a, a set of smart contracts, uh, which in itself then creates a kind of an app, app store, like, you know, on your phone or on your tablet. Um, and people are starting to write, uh, you know, sub apps or whatever you want to say in there uh, that have different, um, capabilities like a rage quit feature or a um a link to an oracle on a chain link to get some external some information external to the blockchain um and so uh, yeah this is and then now this is an open ecosystem so like the community that uses these tools can build more tools and then that's kind of the the, the virtuous cycle you really want to see if you're trying to help bootstrap a, a community All right, next slide uh, please brian and uh, here's a project that's coming a bit more from the art world uh, called Black Swan DAO. Uh, this is very interesting because it's using a lot of the logics and the affordances and the concepts which we've realized through 10 years of blockchain uh, governance research, uh, but it's not actually using the blockchain as the infrastructure to enact them. So we're using the blockchain logics and we're using Web2 infrastructure. And in some ways, if you're, if you're um, taking the right things from both places, you might end up with the, the best of both worlds. Uh, so this is a project which is prototyping uh, using uh, collective governance um, mechanisms for fairer and more equitable distribution of resources in the art world. Um, and uh, they're using things like quadratic voting, which I'm sure has been like uh, on uh, on many people on many people's minds. Uh, and it's something that's come out of, or it's been popularized by its use in the wild, in the blockchain space as a way of trying to mitigate uh, plutarchies or oligarchies uh, in these systems when uh, one token means one vote we often end up with very um, unequal supply distributions of these tokens um, and so then the the tendency towards plutocracy is always there so you can use composability as a, as a means to, to mitigate against uh, some of these things um, so yeah this is like a a little bit of flavor on this slide. I don't think you'll be able to pick out many of the, the details here, but the um, the Black Swan project is very interesting because they're pulling uh, concepts from all kinds of areas of the, the, the philosophical and technical spectrum uh, to try and um, uh, uh, kind of uh, spark the creative imaginations of people in the art world. And you can imagine that those then feed back into the capabilities and the, uh, the possibilities of the technology uh, in the future. Art is very often the most interesting laboratory for uh, frontier work in uh, technology, uh, surprisingly perhaps, because the stakes are so low. So in the legal world, if you put a, uh, a, a, a tool out in the wild, and it's being used in the, in the practice in the field, then there's stakes there, there's liability, there's you know lawsuits and, and all the rest of it. In the art world, it's a bit different. So very interestingly, you can often find in the art world, um, like a, a sign as to where things might be going. Uh, the next slide, uh, please, Ryan. And so, um, yeah, just coming back to uh, maybe like the, the flip side, so we've kind of we've had this very positive picture of like wow we can compose we can do uh, we can use um, 
uh, governance tools in new and excited ways and have these positive sum win wins. Well, I mean, it's not all roses, like I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes crypto economics is kind of, a, you know, using the incentives in these blockchain networks with tokens to try and enact behavioral goals. Uh, sometimes it doesn't go the way that the designs of the systems intended. Uh, so, so, you know, we've treated these things like uniform uh, uh, solutions, like, you know, it's a hammer and uh, then all of a sudden what we see are nails. Um, you know, the systems don't necessarily engender trust and confidence in themselves. Like, it's not just if we build it, they will come. People need to um, have faith in the system, however they reach that. Um, yeah, there's a tension between accountability. Oh, go ahead. Does it, we, yeah. yeah, if we could, I just want to make sure we can leave at least a moment for a question or a reaction. If, sure, if, I'll, I'll yield and we'll leave this on the screen as uh, food for thought. Yeah, was there any final thing you wanted to say by way of wrap? I'm sorry, I interrupted you mid-sentence. I mean, just really that there's two sides here. Like, so if we if we can live by composability and we get all these affordances, uh, but also like on the flip side, uh, you know, when things go wrong, they can go more wrong because interdependency also breeds contagion. So like, I want to say that we can live by composability, but it also might mean we die by it. So just a cautionary tale. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, and my... Uh... My outro will be uh, both the discussion on composable governance and chat GPT really get at this idea that law, uh, that, that our, uh, our, uh, our PI Sandy Pentland has put out, that law itself is actually an algorithm. You know, you can think of it in, as an algorithm with different, you know, different functions, different inputs, different outputs, uh, and some of those outputs have traditionally been from people. Um, some of those are increasingly done by technology. Um, there's an appropriate place and appropriate use for uh, different tools in different locations. And what we should be really thinking about is how we can how we can design these systems, how we can test these systems, how we can measure these systems, and how we can sort of re reiterate upon these systems in order to meet the unmet need and unmet demand that exists in the marketplace as it is today. Here, here. Thank you so much for that quick update. I know there's a lot more to say. Um, everybody, two things. Number one, stand by for the second and final batch of articles that, um, that our editorial team is hard at work. And I know some of the authors are here, so I promise you we're hard at work and we will publish that. And number two, um, we, we had a pre-meet and we're going to do a kind of a composable governance focused um, session once we've Publish the the uh, entire special release. So um, stand by for that as well.